Hey everybody, this is David. Thanks for checking out my show. Today I have Matthew Justice on and he's got a new book that's about to be released called How Computers Really Work. What caught my eye on this is it really gives you a hands-on uh, guide on how computers work. So I bought a bunch of electrical equipment and I'm going through the book right now. It's not a book you can speed read. You've got to go through the different chapters. It talks about binary code and different like hex code and all that good stuff. And then starts to break down how the devices actually work and then gives you some exposure to electrical engineering and then continues to deep dive and connect all of that stuff. So I'm working through that. I really love it. I feel like I didn't get exposed to this stuff at all when I was in school, which is crazy because I grew up in LA and there was a lot of software around me in the 90s. So I used Photoshop and Dreamweaver and Flash way, way, way back in the day. And I was playing with computers probably like in the mid 90s. I was on eBay and stuff, but there was never a course or anyone around who was showing me how to take the computers apart, put them back together, even though I kind of did it as for fun. There's a prize electronics and Burbank, which is huge. So I would go there and use pieces of uh, PCs and connect it and make computers. But I, I really didn't get to understand like to a deep level, what's going on with these computers? How does it all connect? And really how, how does computer programming connect with actual hardware? So this book talks about that, it's super interesting. So hopefully you enjoy this um, next guest, Matthew. Thank you. The David Bramante Show. Hey, Matthew. This is David. Hey, David. Hey, thanks for uh, coming on the show. I'm glad to be here. For sure. Um, so you have a book coming out, a book, and it's called How Computers Really Work. And I got the early edition, which was awesome. So I'm, I'm going, I'm working through it very slowly. Um, normally, I don't read books that are so technical. So, um, but I've, I've been wanting to find a book like this for a long, long time. So first off, congrats on putting it together. It seems like a huge endeavor. Oh, thank you. And it's really great to hear that you've been looking for something like this because I, I hope there was an audience for the, for the book. So I'm glad to hear that there's at least, at least one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, as I'm going through the book, like, I don't, I don't know what happened, but I was in, in honors classes. I took science, I took AP science. I'm trying to like figure out where did I miss all this stuff? Mm. It's very weird. So I don't know. It seems like you were exposed to this super early on when you were younger, but was it, how did that happen? Yeah, yes and no. So it's interesting you bring the, the education aspect of this. And that's actually a good part of the reason of why I wrote it, because I feel like most people today aren't exposed to this kind of information. You have to really go look for it. It's out there. But it's not it's not um, communicated in school, and um, even when it is communicated, you get pieces of it, but but not the the bigger the bigger picture. Um, and so for me, for me personally, it was a journey, right? I I was exposed to some of it early, in that um, my parents got a Apple II when I was um, fairly young, and we you know I got to play around with it at home, and my my um, middle school had a class on basic programming, and I took that and learned some about coding, but. During that, during those early years, I always had a feeling that I was missing the full story. Like I, I saw that I could use basic programming to make the computer do simple tasks, but it didn't explain to me at all how that was working. Right? There was like this gap between the science of it and the the, the programming part of it. Or like I could tell the I could tell the computer do this thing, but how what was really happening? It wasn't clear. Right? So for me, it was a journey of starting there, but then you know. I, learning on my own in high school, ended up going to college in electrical engineering, and then ended up working at Microsoft. And it really wasn't until I got to Microsoft and worked there for a number of years that I really could sort of see the, the bigger picture of how all these different things fit together. Right. And um, so, yeah, I, th I don't think your experience is, un is uncommon at all. And I think that's part of, partly why I wanted to write a book like this. What city did you grow up in? I grew up in Kingsport, Tennessee, very small place. Um, you were saying in middle school they had a basic programming class yeah yeah the um there was a we had a computer lab with apple II computers i think there was some kind of 
um, program where computers were, where schools were donated Apple computers. I think it was one Apple's way of, you know, um, getting in front of potential future consumers at the time, you know, such a brilliant, yeah, I think it's a brilliant thing that they did that. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, we had one class and, um, it was, it was an introduction for me. And, uh, like, I think I even mentioned in the book, I would, we, because I had an Apple at home too, I would take my work home on a floppy disk and, you know, keep going at home. Right. Um, but that was, you know, that was on my own. It wasn't like the, the class was requiring that. I mean, I just, I just had a, a passion and an interest that I wanted to keep pursuing it further than what was being taught. Right. And I read just because it's brief, you don't go into it too much. Was your dad an engineer? It sounded like maybe you got some of the taste for this from. Yeah. Him. Yeah. My dad was um, an industrial engineer, so not directly focused on computers, but he actually did do some computer stuff early on when he was in college. Like he, he, he um, wrote a little book on Fortran and taught a, taught a, a college level class on it, I think. And um, so, you know, he at, at home, he would encourage me to get involved with technology and, and learn about stuff. And so um, definitely my technical, just general technical mindset comes from, from my dad and his way of thinking. And, and how, how old were you when you first got exposed to the more technical side of the electronics? Um, I'd say it wasn't really until college. Um, I, so I, I came out of, out of high school with sort of a, you know, I like, I, I, I knew enough about how a computer worked at a high level. I could buy a, a motherboard and stick a processor in it and stick in some RAM. I, you know, I could make it work, but I didn't really understand what was going on. I knew enough to, to, to you know, um, to go in and, 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 and make things happen, but I didn't really understand it. And then in, in college, I was in electrical engineering was my major. And so there I was going very low level, even, you know, to the point where you're know, looking at individual circuits and that kind of thing. Right. And, um, and at the same time that I was in college, that was when the web was really taking off. This was uh, 95, 96. Um, and so I was also learning about the web, which was pretty far removed from circuits, right? So right. I was, I was like, like growing my knowledge toward yeah. the middle, you know, trying to connect those dots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, yeah. The, the thing is, I'm, as I was reading the book, more than most other books that I'm reading, because I read a lot about artificial intelligence and consciousness, this is probably the most technical book that I've read about something that I'm so interested in. And one, I was just like, why haven't I read these before? So I kept reflecting back to my education and kind of getting pissed, a little bit pissed off. Like, I was of the age where I should have, you know, I, I saw you reference the Atari. I didn't play with the Atari, but the NES system, you know, mm -hmm. that Mario Brother, Brothers, Zelda, I played those games. Why was there not also a class as those things were coming up where those, those consoles were being taken apart and explained yeah. to us? It seems like yeah. such a crazy um, waste. And so I have two kids. And I saw you have two kids as well, teen, but they're young. Teens. Actually, actually I have four. Oh, you have four. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Because I saw you reference your two daughters, I think. Or... Yeah, because they were the ones that primarily um, oh, assisted okay. me with the book. Okay. The other two okay. are younger, so. Nice. Yeah. Well, I want four kids, so congrats. <laughs> right. But the thing is, I'm just, you know, I see a lot of times with everybody using the iPhones and the iPads, especially kids, little kids. And one, I think it's horrible for them. But two, I think that a lot of times maybe parents are thinking, oh, my kid is going to be the next Steve Jobs because they have this electrical, you know, they have this device in their hand, but really we're just becoming really good at using consumer electronics. Like I got really good at playing video games, but I have no idea how it worked. Yes. So to me, I just feel there's this huge divide and I feel like it's growing. And um, again, I, sorry, I'm like relating it to me, but it's like such a trigger on this stuff. But um, like the first year of college 2000 in LA, most of the technical and trade related um, programs were closed down. So 2000, 2001, even like automotive. So all mm -hmm. this technical stuff was getting unwound. I did get exposed to like Flash, Dreamweaver um, in the late nineties, but again, it wasn't as technical as it could have been. So it's just really cool that you had that, you know, yeah, just yeah. it's unbelievable. So thank you. You know, I, the education thing hits home with me too. It's actually something that's near and dear to my heart. You know, I, I've heard people say, well-meaning people say that um, today's kids are going to be better equipped than previous generations when it comes to using technology. And I think that may be true when it comes to using technology, right. 
But I'd argue that they're generally no better prepared than anyone else when it comes to understanding how technology works. And in fact, they may be worse off because computers like iPad and smartphones are so easy to use, but generally kind of hard to understand because they're, they're so locked down from both a hardware and a software perspective. You can't really get in there and tinker. Um, right, yeah. You know, I, I felt like I had the advantage of growing up at a time where computers were, you could, you could open the case and get inside and, and, you know, see what was going on. You can't really do that with an iPad, not easily. And, and yeah. also because the software's ecosystem is so locked down. It's not an, it's, it's a consumption device. It's not a creation device. Right. So um, I think, you know, like a, a big part of my usage of, of those Apple computers was programming them. That's what I wanted to do is I wanted to write my own programs. That's not a primary use case um, for most kids using devices today. Yeah, it's crazy. I, you know, I, the book is really technical. So I think anyone that's at all interested or frustrated <clears throat> that's never been exposed to this stuff, I think your book is like phenomenal. Get started. I was even thinking along these lines, you have 12, 13 chapters. Mm -hmm. somewhere okay. around there. It'd be, it would be great if, you know, your book could be modeled or books like this. And the first chapter is first grade, the second chapter, mm -hmm. second grade, and you really just dive in on, in such a deep way and keep building off of that. Um, so yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. That it aligns to the to the grades. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think it would be. I mean, it's so simplistic, but I just the way that you're building it was, uh, you know, that's the it's why I got totally lost in like hex code. One, I was I was reading it because I I've because I have used Photoshop so much for twenty plus years now. Um, hex code was kind of like a what is the point of this? So mm -hmm. as you started to relate it as a bridge between binary and our that like the decimal yeah. system that we're comfortable with i'm like oh now i have a total appreciation for this this code it simplifies you know the binary system which is so it's simple but complicated um mm -hmm. so i really appreciate it but yeah i just kept thinking god this could be you know um a really interesting thing i did buy all the supplies okay. i jumped the gun <laughs> yeah i found the list and uh, i bought them all it was about if i want to do all projects and i do from your book it's gonna the supplies was about Three hundred fifty dollars. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That sounds. I can see how it'd be a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I did it because I just was like, I have been yearning to do electrical engineering for so long, and I've played around with different types of languages, but I'd never deep deep dove in any of them. So you know, like I have my first, like when I opened up the bread box, breadboard, mm -hmm. uh, breadboard. I was like, oh, it's so tiny. I, yeah. thought, I thought it would be like a lot larger. <laughs> they come yeah. in different sizes. There are big ones too. But yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. But I was just like, everything fit in like a little box. And so yeah. I was starting to play around with that. But yeah, it was in, you were starting the bridge in my mind, how all this stuff is connected. So it was, again, and really cool. That's awesome. That's, that's exactly what I'm going for. Because I feel like a lot of these things, when they are taught, they're taught in silos. And it's sort of hard to see the, you know, connection of how they, they go together. Yeah, it was giving me some hope. Okay, good. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, on, on the parts thing, it's interesting that that cost is actually a little higher than I expected. I, I did a Excel spreadsheet early on to kind of get the numbers, but I knew it was going to be quite a bit if you wanted to do everything. But at the same time, I felt like I'm, this really is the best way to learn this stuff, in my opinion. Like, yeah. it, it reinforces it so much more if you do it yourself than if you yeah. just read about it. Yeah, it's tricky because then a lot, kind of along the lines of, uh, you know, I was like, oh, well, I haven't been to Fry's Electronics recently. Mm. And then the last few times I went, which was during kind of the, the height of COVID, um, it looked like they're going out of business. Oh, really? And, yeah, and I know they shut down. But it's like, we don't have Radio Shack anymore. So it's like, you have to go online to buy this stuff. I saw you yep. listed a couple websites I had never even heard of. Um, but, you know, Amazon seemed like it had most of this stuff. Are those other sites you used often? Yeah, so, so the thing about Amazon is... For some parts, they're, they're, it's a good way to, to go. But for others, you can't really buy. You can't just go and say, I want an individual capacitor of this value. You have to buy a 100 pack or whatever, right, yeah. which sometimes is OK. Maybe what you want, and it, particularly if you're a prime customer, it might be actually cheaper just to do it, right? But um, yeah, the websites I put in the book are all, are all good online sources that are more focused specifically on hobbyist electronics um, kind, of, kind of work. So you can get the parts you want. It can be a little more expensive to buy per, you know, per item that way. But sometimes you only need one or two. So you don't, you don't need a hundred or 500 or whatever. Yeah. I got a bunch of little resistors and uh, I'm like, I'll probably never, I got a case, but um, okay. I'm like, wow, this is so many. So, but yeah, now <laughs> well, I have, you'll, just, you'll go I through have them in like a, my camping cooler. I packed, I have it packed <laughs> up in my camping cooler. 
So I pulled nice. it out and was using it all over my like the uh, kitchen table. So do you just, I'm curious on this. Are there in-person hobbyist stores like this anymore in the U S or is this Fry's is the only thing that comes to mind and they're pretty much have empty shelves. Yeah, not, not around here anyway. I, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, I'm not aware of anything that you can walk into. There's, there is a, uh, there's one store in our area that's actually run by Goodwill. It's sort of a trial. I, I don't think that they're nationwide yet, but the Goodwill and in, in, in this area, they've created, they created this store where all their electronic stuff goes to this one store okay. rather than having it in the regular Goodwills. And in addition to that, they also have a section with things like raspberry pies and breadboards and stuff. So I think they're trying to break into that market, but I don't, I don't know if it's been successful for them or not, or if it's going to be a, I don't know if there's, if there's a, enough interest to, to sustain that. You know? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't even remember that. Yeah. Goodwill by in downtown LA, they have uh, it's like a caged off section of the regular thrift store. It's just like a graveyard of computer parts. Um, so I, like when I, I went to Fry's probably like in the late nineties and was putting computers together. But again, there was no like push to really comprehend what, you know, what I was doing. But yeah, PCs were like just plug and play. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, um, in, in the nineties, there were several stores where I was in college that I could go to and they, they just had parts, you know, besides radio. Oh, really? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not there anymore. Yeah. What do you think about that? Do you think that's a problem or people just go online and it's fine? I think as long, I mean, I think people are moving more to online shopping anyway. I think what you really lose is someone to talk to though, right? If you just want to go in and say, look, I want to do this and I don't really know what to, you know, although to be honest, back in the day, Radio Shack employees typically didn't know about the low level stuff. You know, they were there, there to sell the big ticket items. So, but it, there used to be, you know, a specialty electronic stores and those guys normally, normally knew their stuff, but I feel like that's something you just can't really replace online. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'm going to keep pushing through the book. So um, yeah, the I just finished the first project, which is just with a little nine volt battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super simple. I'm like, oh, this is so rudimentary, but you know, I'm figuring it out. You need it, you know, and I, I, I tried to, I debated a little bit on what to do on that project because it doesn't, in the end, you haven't really built a circuit that does much of anything, but you kind of need all that. And I know I went to kind of, I tried to give as much detail as I, as I could about using a multimeter and just assuming that you just don't know. Because if you don't know, how would you know, right? So I tried to just give the the very basics for someone who's coming at it brand new. Yeah, definitely. As I was going through it, I was realizing, I think I love electricity. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know why. When that part, that I was as I was pushing through, but when I got to that part and then you're, when you're going through the, you're talking about electricity, um, you know, and all the analogies with water, I'm like, one, I wish that all the, I think, I wish the terms were just all water related <laughs> yeah, rather yeah. than like specific to electricity. Um, but yeah, once you started like kind of getting your hands dirty and playing with it, it was cool. So do you have any projects? So I've noticed there's, um, is it a system called Adreno? Arduino, yeah. Ar how do you say Arduino. It? Arduino, okay. Yeah. And then is that usually using the Raspberry Pi or what is that built off of? The Arduino is a microcontroller um, that, so, so differentiate between the two. There, there's similarities between Raspberry Pi and Arduino, but they're they're slightly different. So, uh, a Raspberry Pi is a full-on computer, right? It's got um, an operating. It runs full-on Linux, or can even run a certain version of Windows. Um, whereas Arduino is a microcontroller, which just runs the custom code that you push to it, and that's all. It's not it's not running multiple programs in parallel. It's it's just doing what you tell it to do. So it's a simpler device. Mm -hmm. And depending on what you need to do, it can be more cost effective to use an Arduino versus a Raspberry Pi. But for some scenario, like if you, but if you need more advanced capabilities, like you want to run a web server or something, you probably want to do a Raspberry Pi instead. But they're both, they're both useful in that they're small computing devices that can be attached directly to electronics. And they actually work. They're so tiny. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm like the Raspberry Pi, I have heard of it. I've never, I don't, I've never even talked to anyone who's ever brought it up. I've just kind of like seen it here and there online. And then when I ordered it again, you know, my breadboard, I was like thinking it was going to be huge. Yeah. It was so tiny. It was like a little cribbage board. Yeah, um, yeah. Reference for everybody watching. Yeah. Yeah. Like what honestly can that thing do? You're saying it could do, you can run a little server off that thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, in fact, the latest version, the Raspberry Pi 4, they're positioning it as a desktop replacement. Like if you're, if you're, if you don't need, a, you know, a lot of, a lot of powerful CPU for what you do day to day, it's got multi-mon support. You got two monitors hooked up to it. You can um, run Linux, you can run a web browser. Smaller it's, than an iPhone. 
Yeah, it's tiny. So crazy. Okay, so that's that's one system, and then the Adreno or Duino. Arduino. Uh, uh, yeah. That has a sim, some. There's a kind of motherboard. It's got the same. I haven't opened that part up of my uh, cooler full of. Oh, so did you get one of those too? Because I don't think I actually. Tried. Yeah, I got one just because I was curious about it. Yeah, I didn't okay. do that okay. in the pricing. I think. Yeah. So the difference is, you you boot up your your Raspberry Pi to Linux or whatever, and then run programs on it. Versus um, the Arduino, it's just a, you write a program, deploy it to that device, and it just runs. It just runs that code. It, it's okay. not running anything else. You you don't hook it up to a monitor or a keyboard. Like the the Raspberry Pi, you can hook up if you want to to a monitor, a keyboard, and mouse, and use it just like you would a full desktop computer. The Arduino is just run code headless, no no monitor, no keyboard, no mouse, and control a device of, or a circuit of of your choosing. So then what would, what's a practical use of that then? What would you be doing that with? Is that like small robotics? Yeah. Like if you want to, if you want to control, control motors, control a robotic scenario, um, anything where you need to embed logic um, in the past before microcontrollers were so inexpensive, if you needed to have a, a circuit that would control well, anything, any kind of digital circuit, you would often, you, you could buy discrete components, wire them up, build up your circuit, right? All that logic can now be programmed onto an Arduino or similar microcontroller for um, not much cost, and you can also you can you can easily change it, right? That's that's one of the big advantages of it, right? If you you can you can construct that same logic in hardware, but then if you decide you want to make a change, you've got to manually rewire it, redesign it, right? Versus Arduino, it's just a code change. You redeploy, and your logic's your logic's there. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, thanks for explaining those differences. So I've uh, just recently gotten on the TikTok. It's, I'm a little late in the game, but uh, you know, I still have it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I honestly, because what I thought it was only was just like women dancing in bikinis. <laughs> but um, it was. It's very political, and there's a lot of people doing very interesting um, technical projects. So mm. there's this guy who I do want to reach out to, but I, I don't have any understanding of it. He's building a little robotic hand, and there's a lot of people doing this really cool devices do you have any idea or like sense of, are they using these systems to build those little electronic devices yeah it's been pretty common particularly in prototyping phase to use something like an arduino or a raspberry yeah. pi to try something out now if you're going to mass produce it you probably don't um you're probably not going to use an arduino but you might end up using the same um chips that are on the arduino but in a different form factor not something like the arduino is designed to be hands-on for you to reprogram it and reprogram it and that kind of thing if you're mass producing, you don't need that capability. You just okay. need it to, to just roll out with whatever design already in place. Okay. Yeah, for, for prototyping and for in the engineering phase, yeah, definitely. Oh, so that's just a quicker, cheaper way. And like you're saying, you don't have to build out an entire machine. You could just quickly build out the code using this smaller device. Yeah. Oh, yeah. interesting. And then once that's prototyped, then you would build the product. Yeah, you might you might go to a different design at that point, depending on what your needs are. But yeah, there's a lot of also Arduino compatible boards that aren't technically Arduino, but that can the Arduino software can be used to program the device. So like there's um there's a board that I have right now that's got it's like an Arduino, but it also has Wi-Fi built into it. So um, you can use the Arduino software, the same software you would use to program a regular Arduino, but you also have the ability to connect over the internet and do other stuff. So that's another, you know, anytime you have like an embedded device that you like you have, say you got a sensor tracking something and you need to be able to upload data every hour or whatever, that would be a good scenario for that. And then what would, what is the common language that you use or the, that you program? So the, so things? Arduino, the Arduino IDE, the, the developer interface is um, a, a C um, variant. It's basically, it's basically C, okay. but um, it has some, it's a slightly different, but basically it's C. Oh, okay. uh, but you can use other, it's not limited to that. Like the board I was just talking about, um, the Arduino compatible, you can actually also load Python uh, code onto it using, I think it's called MicroPython. There's a couple different versions of that, but um, it basically, there's a Python uh, environment that targets embedded devices. Okay. So you can uh, use Python. It takes up a little bit more space because Python is um, less, uh, it's further away from the hardware than C is, but it's e some people prefer it as a language. So, so like, can you explain? Because that's a reoccurring thing in your book is that there's all these layers, and like for example, when we're just using the iPhone and we're using the apps, that's probably the highest right. layer 
of the of the device and then you go all the way down the lowest level being the actual hardware so yeah, can, you, yeah. can you explain that like how you're saying python's a little bit higher up than c mm, yeah well in that specific case what i'm talking about is that c presents you with raw access to to memory um you basically get you get the address of of a block of memory called a pointer and with that you can write whatever you want to it i mean I say that there's there's limit the operating system also limits what you can do but ignore that for a minute you, okay. you get a you get some you get an address of memory you can go in and manipulate bits how you like and you can get yourself into a lot of trouble because uh you have free reign to do what you want <laughs> you, you can you, you can you know but it also means it's fast and you don't have a lot of stuff in between so that also c typically compiles to um native CPU instructions. So you start with your link, you start with your C code, you compile it, and you end up with instructions that run directly on the CPU. The CPU understands exactly directly what you've written okay. after it's been compiled. Now, okay. Python, on the other hand, is an interpreted language, which means um, you write the code, but then when you run it, you're not running an executable file, you're running an interpreter, python.exe usually on Windows, that reads the code and just does what it says to do. So um, you have another layer in between you and the hardware that's interpreting your code as you run it. Oh, so it's slower. Cool. Yeah. Prevents you from making some mistakes. It keeps you keeps you in a sandbox. Um, mm -hmm. Most modern languages are more are more like that. That have a some kind of layer between you and the operating system and the hardware that uh, sort of keeps you in a playground where you're not going to mess things up got it um and then so the interpreter is is it it's not converting it into these are like basic questions here but the the python language is not using any c it's its own language but it's you or is it getting interpreted into then a base language yeah that's a, okay that's a good question so um partly what you're asking is 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 implementation specific so python as a as a concept the, the language, multiple people could write different interpreters that handle it different ways. Okay. So there's not a single answer to this. The, the most popular, I would say, the version of Python and the original one, the way, way it works today is that as it's interpreting it, it actually compiles it into, um, I'm not going to get into the details, but <laughs> there's a... Yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm curious. I'm listening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's, it, it has a... Um, intermediate language that it compiles it into. And then eventually that has to get run as, as native instructions on the CPU, right? The, the, the Python executable itself, something has to run as, as, uh, as native instructions. That's all the CPU understands. Okay. But there's the code that you wrote isn't what's being run. It's, it's the in, an interpretation of that code by the interpreter. Got it. Okay, cool. So, and so we talked before about so Python. I, I don't actually know as I don't look at the source code, but the the interpreter for Python had to be written in something. It it may have been written in C. A lot a lot of system level stuff is written in C or C plus plus. They're very popular for that type of thing, or or things that need high performance like games. Oh, got it. Okay. So then, so just kind of to go through the stack. So if C is kind of here. Mm -hmm. What would be a language that's getting closer and closer to being able to manipulate the hardware, but so the only still thing really usable by a human being? You still understand. Sure. So underneath, say, the if you're going to go down a lo level lower, closer to hardware, you're going to go to assembly language. Got it. So assembly language is just a human readable representation of of machine language, which is the, the binary instructions that CPUs understand. So CPUs have a native, every CPU family has a native set of instructions that it understands. And those instructions uh, in their pure, in their, their true form that they get executed in are just by sequences of binary values, right? Mm -hmm. But working, working with that is, you know, humans don't want to be typing in binary values or hex values as they're coding. So um, assembly language is just a one-to-one -one mapping of those binary sequences to a human readable um, sequence. So you're still telling, so what you're, if you're writing in language, 
you're telling the CPU exactly what to do in the language that it understands. It's just you're writing it in a human readable form. And when it gets converted, there's so in C, you say you compile the code. In assembly, you just assemble the code. There's no, the compiler makes decisions about, well, the, the writer of this develop, the, the developer asked for a loop and I'm going to implement it like this. In assembly language, there's no interpretation like that. It's just literally do these things and, and the assembler just converts it to the binary equivalent. There's no mm -hmm. guesswork involved. I mean, you're, you're telling the CPU exactly what to do. Right, yeah. And then, because I saw you, so you worked on the debugging the Windows kernel. Is mm -hmm. that in C? Is that an assembly language? What is it that you're actually doing? That's a great question. Um, so when you're debugging, you have to, okay, there's, there's kind of multiple parts to this. Okay. The, the, the operating system for Windows is written in C and C++. So on one hand, I've got the source code as, as a developer at Microsoft, a developer in, or support engineer at Microsoft, I have um, the source code. But when it's running, it's already been compiled into machine, machine language, right? So when I'm debugging the kernel, what I have is the machine code that's executing. And I can look at it as assembly language because that's a one-to-one -one mapping. Either way, I can go from assembly to machine code or machine code to assembly. It's just a simple one-to-one -one translation. So what's running on your computer is machine code. If you wanted, and you can do this, anyone can do this. You can use the debugger to, to attach to any process or even the kernel and look at in assembly what's going on um, on that system. Now, if you happen to also have the source code, which I did because I worked at Microsoft, I could then match up the assembly to the source code from where it came and okay. say, oh, OK, this assembly was generated from this source code. And then I could figure out, because if, if there's a bug, it has to be fixed in the source, not in the assembly, right? So you go okay. have to make that mapping. Oh. So usually when I, was, when I was debugging, I've got like one screen where I've got the thing that I'm debugging running. I've got another screen where I've got the debugger up, and another screen where I've got the source code up. And wow. I'm trying to, you know. And you're doing chunks of the code. Mm -hmm. You're debugging yeah. chunks. You're not, because that would be impossible to run the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, Windows is huge, right? Yeah. So um, you have an idea of how, when you were working on it, how large, how many lines the source code was? No, one time I could have told you, but I don't remember anymore. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a large number. I mean, um, I just compiling it. So we would, so on my team, we would, um, when you, when you want to, you want to have a copy of the source code local. Now, most of us didn't work on all of the OS. We had just certain areas you worked on. Right. So I didn't really need all the code, but a lot of times we, we would just go ahead and pull down the entire source code tree in case we needed to cross-reference something or whatever. And that would take quite a while just to download it. And then to build it, we'd all, you'd often you'd want to try to compile it um, or compile part of it. But to compile even a part of it, you often had to compile, like there were things that depended on other things. So you, the simplest thing was just to compile the whole thing. And right. On an individual workstation, that could take a long time, like a couple of days um, okay. to, to compile everything. Um, and were they telling you which, just uh, this is interesting. They were telling you what bugs to go after. So they had a hit list and then you were going and trying to hunt them down. Yeah, so for, for me in particular, I worked in a part of the company that um, was responsible for fixing um, bugs that were reported by customers. So this was stuff, this was in a versions of Windows that were already shipped. So you have, you got the development team over here working on upcoming versions of Windows, but we were working on stuff that was already out in the wild. And um, you, know, you hope that those versions don't have that many bugs, they've already shipped. But um, we were prioritizing based on customer impact. Okay. Uh, and so, and, and we were working specifically with commercial customers. So. We get a call from a you know a Fortune 500 company, and this was typically you know a server issue. You've got we've got you know these servers, and it's impacting you know 10,000 users or whatever, and it's lose, we're losing this much money a day kind of thing. So we have these we prioritize based on on that type of thing, um, and then you know often the the problem came to us. It wasn't clear what where the bug was. It was just we do these things and this bad thing happens, and right. then we, we've got to figure out. Okay, what does that actually mean? You know. Yeah, and so it would be a team working on some. Well, some of these problems would have such a negative impact. There would be multiple people working on the team. Yeah, sometimes it depends. I mean, a lot, a lot of these issues were of the type that you needed 
someone to be fully focused on it. And it wasn't something that necessarily you could multitask, right? Like some, sometimes, yes, sometimes you would say, can you go look at this aspect of it? while I look at this other aspect of it. But a lot of times, once you narrowed it down to the component that's failing, you just needed somebody to just go in and diligently just go through the code and just, you know, analyze it. And that's often was just a, uh, you know, we would put people, more people if it helped, but a lot of times it, you just needed one person to really focus on it. Mm -hmm. And then were the, was it usually just an error, like a human error and the code no. or did the code have to be rewritten? Oh, oh, well, you're saying, is it a error in the original code? Like, like the developer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like even when I've done, you know, programming, it's like the, I mean, it's getting better. They're doing color coding and it's very intuitive now to write, you know, some of the code, but, yeah. um, but even still you make mistakes, which is crazy. I'm like, how did these guys back in the day, they actually yeah. build stuff with no, no color coding, nobody <laughs> checking them. They weren't doing pair, you know, working in pairs, right. which a lot of right. people are doing now. It's so intense to think about how these guys were originally coding. Yeah. So um, to answer that question, I'd say usually the bugs were of a nature that they only occurred when a sequence of multiple things happened together, right? Like the code wasn't really broken on its own in the scenario that it was designed for, but because there was this other factor over here and this other factor over here, when these certain sequence of events happened in a certain order, that kind of thing, uh, right? Okay, okay. So some, sometimes it was a fundamental just logic error, but more often it was, they didn't consider this future scenario that didn't even exist at the time or, or whatever, yeah. right? Uh -huh, um, of things. Yeah, I mean, and you think about Windows in particular runs so much third-party software yeah. that that's a, a big part of it, right? Like the Windows, the Windows team does a really thorough job of testing um, the scenarios that they can, but there's tons of scenarios just with the combined this driver, with, and you know, you just didn't test for that. So yeah, of course. And then what Windows were you working on, which? Which operating system? Mm -hmm. When I started, it was NT4 was like the earliest. Um, and then I was on that team, on the S in the team that did this dedicated debugging role through Windows 7. Mm. But then I, then I left and did some other stuff at the company, not related to Windows. But then I did come back right before I left and worked on Windows 10 a little bit. Oh, cool. Um, there yeah. was... Um, a feature that we were working on where we we're doing that diagnostics for Windows 10 that I got to, to be involved with. So that was fun. Very cool. Could you explain what the Windows kernel is? The sure. actual kernel, yeah. Yeah, so, well, let's just say talk about the kernel in general because Linux has a kernel too. Um, when you talk about the operating system, there's really, um, there's really just two parts. There's the kernel and there's everything else. So the kernel is the, is the code that sits closest to the hardware. Um, the kernel and device drivers are what interface uh, with the hardware. The, um, the kernel itself has the code that runs in the kernel has the ability to um, perform hardware operations uh, that normal programs can't perform. Uh, we need some, something needs to be there to talk directly to the hardware and that's what the kernel does. Um, code outside the kernel is, is called user mode code um, and user mode code is code that is, is, at a, is at a higher level and has to go through the kernel to get anything done. Like the kernel, the kernel is the only thing that can directly interact with hardware. Um, but you don't want to run most code in kernel mode because it has too much power, right? The kernel can do anything. Okay. So applications run in user mode at a higher level of abstraction. And then they need to perform any type of IO operation you need to do anything that interacts with hardware. That includes, you know, reading from the keyboard, drawing to the screen, reading mouse movement, anything. That has to go through the kernel. Um, and the kernel is sort of a broker between applications and the hardware. Um, yeah, that's the gist of it. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks for explaining that. Um, and then I, uh, I was wondering, so do you have any pet projects that you're, that you know, now that I look at the book, seem like you have a pretty thorough understanding of this stuff and i'm seeing on tiktok and you know on youtube people building these little things are you building little pet projects with this knowledge that you have uh, right now i'm working on a game for the nintendo entertainment system um something i've always wanted to do and i hopefully it's the original more the original yeah. system the original yeah. system yeah yeah 
So yeah. hopefully this is more than a pet project. I actually hope to uh, to release this game on cartridge and, and sell it. People actually still do this today. Uh, oh, are people re are releasing new games on the old system. Yep. But you yeah. can run them on your computer now. You don't actually use the console. Yeah, that's right. So I want to do both though. I like I, So most people that are doing this today often will release it on cartridge, but they'll also release either um, a ROM image that you can emulate or, or they'll release a, a port for the PC. So I'm actually working on both. I'm doing a original NES um, version that I hope to release on cartridge Very cool. uh, and also a PC port of the game um, that basically is, it plays just the same, but I'm using modern, a modern technology stack to build it. That is so cool. I have my original Zelda and Zelda or Link, yeah, the Zelda 2 cartridges yeah. the gold one yeah. man when i saw those the first time i'm like oh this is the best game ever it's gold yeah, yeah the um, gold the gold really really made it seem like I, how did stuff. nobody think of that before that yeah i know i know amazing um did you did you like playing zelda was that yeah cool? yeah the, the first one i actually never really got into zelda 2 as a yeah. kid i didn't have it as a kid i got I, i've actually got it maybe 10 years ago but i still haven't made the time to really yeah play. it's kind of a weird one it's kind of like the departure between mario brothers and mario brothers 2 yeah it's like yeah. a big jump you're like this is why did they do you like <laughs> mario brothers too yeah I, I do like it. it's different so but, trippy yeah it's so weird yeah so where how far are you how far have you developed this game that you have right now i'm sort of in the getting the game engine working because it, it's not like writing a modern game where you take an engine that already exists a 2d physics engine or a 3d engine and just sort of add your assets and stuff like i'm writing it all from scratch so i'm getting you know, I'm doing a platformer style game, so a Mario kind of game. So, you know, I've got to get gravity working. I've got to do collision detection. I've got to do, you know, just all this kind of stuff just to kind of get the feel of the game right. And, and also do it in, uh, you know, in a very efficient way because the NES is not very powerful and you got to be very conservative with your code. And I'm also, um, I'm trying to fit it in the size of a game. The, the, original, the original games for the NES were 40 kilobytes, 40K. And I'm trying to fit it into a 40K uh, memory constraint, which is tiny, you know, compared to what we're used to today. Isn't that so crazy? It is. Yeah, I think it's just like, even how did they send men to the moon? I know. Little, I know. little things. Like, if they did it, I don't know. It's so hard to believe because I, I can't even believe the NES existed. Because <laughs> when I look at these games, I'm like, the visuals were pretty good. Pretty good. The games were pretty good. The music was pretty good. Like, yeah. they accomplished so many amazing things with it seems like such little amount of memory, right? Absolutely, yeah, I, I'm gaining, I mean, I was already, I already had a good respect for those guys, but as I'm doing it myself now, I'm like, wow, you know, particularly because we have pr pretty good tools today for debugging NES, because I can do it on my computer with a real-time debugger and so forth. They didn't have any of that stuff like that. Do you know and how they did do it? What, what is it written in? What, what it's assembly. It? It's assembly for the oh, 6502 okay. processor. Oh, so they so, were doing, so that was all assembly that they were using for all that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, pretty complicated. It is. Why, it is. why do you think they didn't use C at the time? Because C was available. Um, so it, the, a couple of reasons, I think. One is it's not as, um, it's not as efficient. Uh, and you don't have the same kind of control over exactly how things are, are, laid out like you end up compiling code and it may not optimize it the way you'd expect for the processor and also there's certain things about the 60 about the c language that just don't really mesh well i actually looked at doing my game in c okay and um the the it's because of the memory can basically comes down to memory because of the way the c uses memory it just isn't really compatible easily with the um with the 6502 processor and the way the memory is laid out on the nes if you did it in C, you would be doing a lot of things that not the way you would normally do it in C. You'd be bending, you'd be bending the language to make it fit, and it would almost be like writing an assembly because you have to be thinking about the whole time well, what's the hardware actually going to do here. Uh -huh. um, so you you lose a lot of the advantage of doing it in C because C isn't quite the right fit. So you the whole time you're writing in C, you'd have to be thinking about well, what is this actually going to compile to? Yeah, and you kind of lose the you know, the advantage. And then um, that, that processor that you're talking about, was that a fairly common process? This, yeah. What was it called? 6502. 6502. Yeah. It was was that, that was widely available at the time? Yeah, it was. The version in the NES is a little different than a stock one. Okay. Um, they removed 
one of the processor modes for to make it cheaper to manufacture. Oh. But but anyone who knew 6502 uh, at the time would have been able to, you know, jump in and use it, use oh. the NES. Oh. Um, it's it, it's interesting. Um, so for me, because I'm writing a PC version too, what I've done is I've actually I'm actually doing three projects. I'm writing the NES version. I'm writing the PC version. But for the PC, I've also written a um, an NES simulator for the PC, so that I can write my PC code as if I was talking to the NES. Um, uh, so, so it's constraining me to the same number of colors and the same number, the same resolution, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so what I end up doing is writing it in C first. So like if I'm writing a new algorithm, I write it in C so that I have the high level logic for the PC. And then I go write it for the um, NES. And it's almost like I'm being a human, human compiler. I'm looking at my C code and then rewriting it for 6502 assembly. Wow. So when is this going to be done? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is just like a lifelong goal. No, no, no. I, I oh. hope to. I hope to get it done. I mean, I you would love be in your to see 80s releasing this cartridge. This is going to be. My, I guess my. Fun. I guess if I had to pick a goal, I'd say next year. Like I expect to take. I expect it'll take 2021 to get it to a pretty workable phase. I don't have a good feel yet for like what's it going to take to get the cartridges manufactured and boxes produced and manuals printed like there's a lot of stuff like that that i've not really looked into yet that people do it but I, i'm gonna have to do some research do you need to get approval from nintendo to make these games no they they're well i, I shouldn't i can't speak to the legal side i'm not a lawyer yeah, yeah, but my yeah. understanding is that they aren't concerned about it's like just, a hobbyist thing they're fine with yeah. yeah yeah that's cool man that's interesting do you already have the actual gameplay mapped out or are you still just working on the um, parts of it? Uh -huh. It's it's not. I mean, a lot of what I'm doing right now is just sort of getting a feel for the system and making. I've only been working on it for three months now. So, yeah. um, but I have I have an idea. But it could change. You know, I, I I'm kind I'm kind I'm making up some stuff along the way, giving myself some goals. Okay, I want to make the character be able to do this, and then I do it. But then when I'm done, I'm, I may end up saying, well, that's actually not what I want to do. But I want to make sure that I can do it you know yeah yeah well let me okay so to tie in your book now because <laughs> so do you feel like you could build the console the nes console from scratch with the knowledge that you have no no i could i, I could do parts of it but uh -huh. um and wh where is the limitation like after i read your book there's no way i'm building an nes <laughs> to myself yeah what, what well, is it that i would be missing well okay it's two different questions what would you be missing what would i be missing yeah for sure. uh, for sure. So for what oh, I've been missing, yeah. <laughs> so despite my degree being electrical engineering, my my professional career at Microsoft, which is all of my professional career up until I wrote the book, um, was primarily in software. So I, if I, I, I I'm not, a, I couldn't go out and and uh, design the motherboard and design, you know, all all of, all of that kind of stuff. Like I understand how a lot of it works, but I don't have the expertise to actually use the tools to to lay out the components on the circuit board and all that stuff. I mean, I could learn it, but I don't, I don't have that knowledge today. The yeah. practical aspect of how you go about manufacturing that kind of thing. For sure. What would I be missing? <laughs> Everything. Uh, 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 well, yeah. <laughs> you'd probably need to take the first um, six or seven chapters and just go a whole lot deeper than, than what they cover. Like the topics are there, like those are the topics you need to know, right. but they're, you know, introduction to those topics. So you need to go deeper. Yeah, definitely. That's so funny. Yeah, I would love to do a game too. That's cool you're doing that. Um, all right, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to tie that back in. So the main computer you were working on was the Apple II. That was just called basic programming, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then you kind of branched into C from that. Is that kind of the order that you did it in? Yeah, uh, let me think about that. Um, I guess after basic, I really kind of picked up two languages, C and Visual Basic. So Visual Basic was Microsoft's attempt in the. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the '90s, may, maybe a little earlier, but to uh, to create an easy to learn programming environment where there was a lot of drag and drop. You know, you can draw your button, and you say when the button is clicked, do this. Yeah. And it uses the same sort of similar syntax of the basic programming language. So I already had Basic, and it was my entry to Windows programming. Um, and then at the same time, I was learning C in college, but I ended up loving it. Like C is probably my favorite language. So I ended up, I use it for a lot of things now because I like it, but um, I learned C in college for, for lower level stuff. We were writing C 
to control, to interface with um, hardware devices and that kind of stuff because it was electrical engineering. So it was lower level stuff. Uh -huh. But um, when, you sound, when you say lower level, it almost sounds demeaning. But what the terminology is basically you're getting just closer to the hardware. Lower level on the stack, right? Yeah, yeah. To me, it seems uh, like higher, higher intellectual level to <laughs> drilling down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good point, right? Let's, yeah. Those terms probably aren't in the general populace's vocabulary the way I'm using them, right? Yeah. yeah I'm talking about just how far away you are from the hardware. It has nothing to do with how hard the the work is. Like, there's yeah. challenging engineering work or software development work to be done at every right. layer of the stack. Yeah, that's cool. And then what? In, what in particular? Because I've I've read. It seems like people learn one program language, obviously out of comfort, they use it, they work in it, they get paid to use it. And then yeah. they, that's pretty much where they're set for the rest of their lives. Some people kind of branch out and learn other languages. What in particular do you love about C? Um, I like that it's straightforward, that it, it doesn't contain a lot of um, additional overhead. Like it, it lets me do what I want to do. And it's very, I, I, I understand when I write C, almost exactly what it's going to compile into and what it's going to look like, what it's what's going to actually happen on the processor, um, which sometimes you don't need to know that, but I, I like to know it. I, I, I that's the way I think, and um, because I spent so much time at Microsoft looking at C code and looking at assembly code and how they went together, I really understand the language just really well because of right. that. Yeah, and. Um, so part of it's just comfort, you know, and yeah. and it's, it's a procedural language, meaning it's you just write out what you want to do and it does it. There's not there's there's other more complex uh, ways of writing code, different different approaches. There's um, functional languages and there's object oriented languages, which have their place and, and can be useful as well. Um, but for a lot of what I do, I just want a list of steps that execute something. And for that, C is straightforward. It works. Um, and, and it's, it's ubiquitous, right? It, any, it runs on anything and it's super efficient. So you don't have to worry about performance. It's always, you know, assuming you write good code, it's, it's going to be fast. Right. Have you played around with some of the newer code? Like probably like four or five years ago, Ruby, Ruby on rails was huge. Did you yeah. play around with those? Seemed kind of trendy because now I don't hear too many people talk about it anymore. No, Ruby's not one that I ever really got into. I mean, I, I tend to, to look at languages as they come out, but I often, you know, whether I actually use them for anything is another question. Yeah. Um, for me, the most recent thing I looked at was Go. Uh, it's um, a language that I believe Google developed that is a mm -hmm. sort of a C-like syntax, but it compiles into native code, but it has some safeguards that make it... Um, uh, more modern than, than C. Uh, I like it. Um, Python is not exactly modern, but it's, re it's, re it's received a modern resurgence in popularity because of its use in uh, data science, yeah. particularly. So Python is the other one that I, I tend to use. So like in the project I'm working on right now, um, like I said, the NES game is assembly, the PC game is C, but if I'm writing any kind of, I also have some scripts in there that like transform data from one format to another, okay. not, not, for, not at runtime, but as part of the development process, all those scripts I'm writing in Python. So, you know, oh, cool. whatever makes sense. Um, JavaScript, of course, like any, pretty much most developers need to know a little bit of JavaScript today because the web is so popular and it is, it's the language of the web. So anything that runs in the web browser is JavaScript. So yeah, that's, that's really exploded over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then, um, so with, yeah, I noticed that like a lot of the machine learning, deep learning, that's that's all in Python. That's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So then now just to loop back to kind of the beginning of what we were talking about. So you've got four kids. Are you trying to get them into this world? They're getting exposed, like your dad exposed you, but are you really trying to lead them into really understanding the stuff? Yes, I, I mean, it, you know, it depends on sort of what's going on in their lives at the time. Like my, my oldest are in high school now and they're pretty busy. But uh, earlier, I definitely spent a lot of time with them teaching them this stuff. And actually that was part of what inspired me to do this is because um, I was teaching my kids these concepts at home and they could, and they could understand it. You know, if you explain it in the right way, um, you know, kids, kids can pick up on this stuff. You just have to figure out what the right level is to explain it to them. And um, at the same time that I was doing that, I was interviewing uh, people at Microsoft for software engineering jobs. And I was surprised how often the people I was interviewing didn't know some of this how stuff works uh, details, right? And um, no fault of theirs. These are smart people. They were, you know, they a lot of them had computer science degrees, 
but it was, it was just interesting to me. It was telling to me what they weren't being taught and that I was trying to teach my kids. And I'm like, if I can teach my kids this, I, like, I want to teach these other people this too, the people that I'm interviewing who just graduated with a computer science degree, who right. I feel like ought to know this stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's mainly the electrical and engineering component seems to be missing for a lot of- Part of it is, but even the, even the um, some of the operating system stuff and the details of how the internet works, some of that stuff, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I get, I'm sure it's specific. I don't want to. I don't want to be too negative on the education system because I. I'm, I'm sure it really varies by school and and so forth. But just in my experience as an interviewer at Microsoft, yeah. I was I was surprised how often people didn't. They could write code. Like if you ask them to write an algorithm to do whatever, they could do it. But wow. then when you start asking them about well, what's actually happening here? What's you know you know and then the, often it was just sort of. How would I know? You know, was that part of the actual interview process? Or you were just curious, like, how deep does this does their knowledge? Like, out of curiosity, depends, you just wanted to know. It depends on which team I was interviewing for. Oh. When I was interviewing for um, people for the uh, the debugging the Windows kernel type job, I wanted to know how deep they could go, right. um, because that's that there was no limit to how deep you might have to go when you're debugging something like that. So I would just ask them questions until. They didn't have any more answers, or, or, I, or I didn't have any more questions. Usually, usually, they, usually they ran out of answers before I ran out of questions. But um, <laughs> um, but then later, when I was interviewing people for hire, like so later, I was a manager of a team that was developing web applications. So you know, it really wouldn't have made sense for me to ask them about how the kernel works in that scenario. But I would ask them about how the network stack works, right? Like if they're building a web application, and they show me they can write good web code, you know, whether that's client side or server side. But then I would ask questions about, well, you know, if, if you have some kind of problem on the network, let's talk about how things can go wrong, because that's a real part, because particularly today, software engineering has evolved into a, not just write code, but write code and keep your application running, because, because, mm. you know, apps today are live services running 100% of the time on the internet, right. they're not yeah. just software you ship on a CD anymore, right? Yeah. So it was important to me that people could troubleshoot problems and I, and part of that is understanding the underlying architecture of what you're building up yeah that's cool yeah i was thinking about that earlier when you were talking about it i was reading a book about what quickbooks did that they shifted and then they were pushing out updates on their software and moving to web-based so it's like you have to have everything's up and running and you're still shipping out updates on a really frequent schedule right doing a feature mm -hmm. list debugging all while it's still it's all happening you're not waiting like That's right. the different windows are shipping out every couple of years or whatever with the new version. Yeah. Cool. All right, cool. It's been a real shift in the way software engineering is performed. It really used to be a very long period of development, long test period, beta period, you ship, then you start over again, maybe a couple of year cycle. And now those cycles have gotten shorter and shorter. So people, are all, I mean, some teams are shipping as often as, you know, weekly, you know, as the pushing yeah, updates. Unbelievable. Work. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, final question. Okay. Which do you prefer, Star Trek or Star Wars, and why? <laughs> Star Wars. Um, I have a, my, if you were to walk into my uh, library over here, I've got a bookshelf that's completely Star Wars books, like top to bottom. Um, I was a big fan growing up of the, what they, the expanded universe, the stuff outside the movies. Um, and then of course, once Disney uh, took over, they, 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 that's all null, null and void now, but uh, I still have a soft, soft place for it in my heart. I, yeah. I, I'm not quite sold on the, some of the new Disney stuff, but you know, that's yeah. Right. yeah. How about you? Um, I, I prefer Star Wars, I think just because I was the age where I watched them all. Um, I was disappointed by the 90s versions. Like, I'm like, oh, this is, he ruined his own stuff. <laughs> and a lot of people have said the same thing and then they go and rewatch them and they, and they have appreciation for them. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to, so I don't want to do it. Um, the original stuff is so amazing. And I've, I've been watching the Mandalorian. Yeah, me too. Have you been watching it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm even still disappointed with that. Like on the, the last episode, I'm just like enough with these side quests. Can I have more character development? Can I have yeah. more? I mean, not that the original ones didn't have like a lot of humor and action, but I'm just like, I, you have an opportunity to deep dive into a new universe. People have bought into it. It's a cool concept to have this like cult, you know, group. Um, and so I just feel like, God, why are they wasting this opportunity? It's really <laughs> frustrating to watch. But uh, I've, I've been watching on YouTube. There's these uh, fan films, fan edits. Have you seen yes. it? Uh, of the original 
yeah they did the original or they'll like they'll do there's one that's uh like a, a they refilmed the fight between obi-wan kenobi and darth vader oh yeah to make it much more intense sort it's of action. so intense yeah, yeah. If people yeah. saw that in what in 77 they would have right. been horrified yeah. So, yeah but you know i've been I, some of the guests i talked to they love star trek so i'm going yeah. back and watching some of those episodes those are respectable for the 60s yeah yeah, yeah. it's good material too it's this is different i of st- when it comes to star trek deep space nine is actually my my favorite which is sort of the black sheep i think i think a lot of Star Trek fans actually don't like it as well, but I do like it. So why do you like that one? Uh, it's it's a lot. The story is much deeper. It doesn't. They you know next generation time period and the original series and even Voyager. They were trying to really each episode stood alone. Like you should be able to t- tune in and watch any one episode and know what's going on. By the time Deep Space Nine got to season three, four, or five, they've had these long arcs of story, which which was today is common in TV. Right. But at the time, it wasn't. And I liked that there was the depth of storytelling that, you know, you, yeah, you had to watch 10 episodes to really understand what was going on. But yeah, very cool. I like that. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much. Congrats again on the book. It's really awesome. I'm going to keep working through the project. So if I have any questions, I'll hit you up. Yeah, please do. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. All right, cool. Thanks, Matthew. Bye. All right, bye.